So now let's bring all of these concepts together in a final overview. Reproductive isolation can occur before fertilization. So we have individuals of two different species. They may not be able to mate in the first place because of habitat isolation, squirrels on the north side of the Grand Canyon versus the south. There might be temporal isolation. They might live in the same pond, but their mating season occurs in different months. There might be behavioral isolation. They don't recognize the calls of each other when it's time to mate. So these all prevent mating from happening in the first place. There may be times where two different species try to mate, but the male reproductive organ can't fit inside the female, so that's mechanical isolation. Or the pollen may not be able to form tubes that go all the way in to reach the ovule. That's gametic isolation. All of those prevent fertilization from taking place. So these are all prezygotic reproductive isolation mechanisms. Now, it can still happen that a male from species A can mate with a female of species B, and there's fertilization, but then there are postzygotic isolation mechanisms. And this could be from reduced hybrid viability, so the little tadpoles die before they grow into to adult hybrid frogs. There might be hybrid sterility or reduced hybrid fertility, like in the mule. Or the F1 may grow up and be fertile, but then their offspring break down. So we have hybrid breakdown in the case of those little crustacea called copepods and green beans. If none of these are working. If none of these reproductive isolation mechanisms work, then you could have the mixture of two different gene pools to have viable fertile offspring. Well, then those would not be properly separate species. So one of these mechanisms is likely operating in every case to prevent one species from blurring in to another. So Darwin wrote about the origin of species. And this was a revolutionary concept at the time. Species were arising. He outlined some of the ways that this could happen. This was key to his whole explanation of the of evolutionary process. But it's not something that's just a process that happened millions of years ago. Speciation still happens today. All populations on Earth are evolving. There are changes in gene frequencies. There are populations that become subdivided, no longer mate with each other. They're on their way to becoming different species. This is being done deliberately, again, by plant scientists. So agronomists deliberately make new breeds of plant that are reproductively isolated. In the production of durum wheat, which is used for making pasta, that's a very careful breeding method to produce a hexaploid, hexaploid hybrid. So instead of having four copies of each chromosome, now there's six. But again, there's an even number, so they can undergo meiosis and they can stay within their own gene pool and they're fertile. But this is a deliberate attempt by agronomists to now reproductively isolate a whole strain of wheat from another. It's effectively a new species. And we're also seeing right now, and I will show examples through the remainder of the course, how ecological change is ongoing. We're in the middle of enormous changes in our climate across the world. And whenever there's ecological change, this creates new ecological opportunities. And this will also cause new events of separation of subpopulations of what was once a continuous single species. So speciation is likely always to continue, and if anything, will accelerate as the Earth becomes more disrupted by human activities. As an example of a relatively recent speciation event, let's look at the apple maggot. If you've ever bitten into an apple and found only half a worm, this is an apple maggot. Now, let's think about the history of plants and crops here in North America. Native to North America, is a plant that's somewhat related to the apple. It's called a hawthorn. And the hawthorn is a perfectly normal native species to this continent. And it has a pest called the hawthorn maggot that feeds on its fruit. Okay? 
Now, in the 1600s, European settlers brought apples to the New World from Europe. And for several hundred years, they had a great time growing their apples. There were very few pests on them. But in the 1860s, they noticed for the first time apple maggots. Okay? Now, we now know that the hawthorn maggot is the ancestor, the direct ancestor of the apple maggot, that the apple maggot descended by becoming specialists on a new food plant within the same geographical area as the hawthorn. And how this seems to have been achieved is that, yes, they may be in trees that are very close to each other, hawthorns next to apple trees, but they have slightly different breeding seasons. And so those hawthorn maggots that started to specialize more on apple, apple trees instead, they developed an earlier breeding period. And so they would actually emerge earlier in the year. And so here's the time of, of year going along here. And this is the percentage of the larvae that are active in the population. And so these apple maggots are coming out and they're ready to go, feasting on their apples beginning uh, early in August, and then they've pretty much finished, gone through their whole life cycle uh, by the fall. However, the hawthorn maggots, so the original stock, remain specialized in the hawthorn fruit, and they didn't emerge, or they don't emerge, till about a month later. So this timing in emergence is enough so that these relatively short-lived animals, these are all only going to breed with each other before the hawthorn maggots come out and then they'll all only mate with each other as well. And so these are now perfectly good separate species with adaptations to their respective diets. And this has all happened just in the last few hundred years. Again, this can be done experimentally, where we have certain food supply. Here's a study in um, a tree hopper. So it's an insect here. This one has kind of a funny thing growing out of its head. Here's one that looks slightly different. And this one specializes on a certain kind of crop called a bittersweet or a plant called bittersweet. This one focuses on the butternut. And so the scientists in this study actually took out a subset of tree hoppers and forced them to colonize a new species. Okay? And the colonizing population became physically distinct in just 20 years. So you can, if you impose upon these animals, reproductive isolation by giving them something new to eat, they become adapted to it. It's like that island speciation happening though within the same general area here, and they become rapidly adapted to an entirely new set of circumstances. And then they become a separate species. So butternut tree hoppers now only mate with each other, and bittersweet only mate with bittersweet tree hoppers. So a new species was formed in only a few decades. So that brings me back now, finally, to the original question I asked at the beginning of this lecture. One third of all animal species are beetles. What's so special about beetles? Why is there such an incredible diversity of beetle species? So to understand the proliferation of the beetles, we need to be aware of the complexity of the broader environment in which beetles live. And to do this, let's think about where they live. And where they live is associated typically with one plant species, one beetle species for each plant species. So if we go back hundreds of millions of years, the first plants that came up on land were mosses. And then came the ferns, and then the vascular plants, those that have st stalks and stems, uh, and you have the conifers. And then about here, about 130 million years ago, we have the origins of the flowering plants. Okay? So they have proliferated in the last 100, 150 million years. Now the key difference between the conifers and the flowering plants is that the conifers just throw their pollen out into the air. Okay? And they rely on good luck for their pollen to actually find another flower to, in order to fertilize the, the seeds. Flowering plants, though, those flowers are deliberate, 
attempts by the plant to manipulate a pollinator, okay, to carry their pollen somewhere else. A few of the flowering plants are still wind pollinated, but most of them are insect pollinated. And so insect pollination provides enormous opportunities for reproductive isolation. If you've got some mutant plant with a mutant flower that puts its pollen on a particular part of the bee's back, and then it's only going to be pollinating another flower that is ready to receive the pollen from that very specialized part of the bee's back, then that's going to be rapidly separated reproductively from all the other members of its kind. So we have our pollinators who are going out. They're very, very focused on what they're going to do. They're looking for specific kinds of flowers. Once they get there, there are these very precise mechanisms that the flower may use to bring the pollen down and put it onto the body of the bee. And so that pollen now is ready to go to fertilize the eggs of another individual, but only if that other plant is able to extract the pollen off that very specific part of the bee's body. So this allows for very, very frequent events of reproductive isolation compared to the shotgun sh uh, strategy of just throwing pollen out into the atmosphere. So there they are, still doing their thing, very specialized in where the pollen goes on just a certain part of the bee's body. Okay, so if we look at the number of plant species worldwide, even though the conifers are an older group of plants, they're not very species rich. There's only 721 different species of conifers all over the world. But because of this very specific form of pollination, leading to frequent reproductive isolation in the flowering plants, there's 235,000 different species of plants, flowering plants. So, if we look at the beetles, very species rich, if we were just looking at beetles that lived in conifers, we wouldn't be impressed. All around the world, there's only 225 different species of beetle associated with conifers, but over 100,000 different beetle species that are associated with flowering plants. Each beetle gets specialized in living in the roots or somehow finding a home in the plant biomass of a particular species. So beetles are living in a very complex planet. I've written here that they occupy an enormous global archipelago of specialized habitats. This very beautiful metallic green beetle is very specialized in where it goes. So it's only going to come into contact with its own kind in a very special uh, habitat which is different from this one, which is different from this one, which is different from this one. So their world is full of island speciation opportunities, and so therefore they become very species rich. 100,000 different species associated with flowering plants. Now, then let's come back one last time and consider the poor old coelacanth. This is a species that's been around for 300 million years three times as long as there's been flowering plants up on the Earth's surface. They live in a very, very simple environment. It's about 200 meters, that's about 650 feet below the surface. It never changes down there. It's constant, it's a simple environment. So there just are not those opportunities to become subdivided, to have any kind of ecological or reproductive isolation from each other. So given the uniformity and the persistence of this broad, bland world that they live in, it's really not that surprising that there's only two living species of coelacanths who are virtually unchanged over the last 360 million years.